Good morning to everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to our services this morning. And uh, for those of you who are here, and we have those that are worshiping with us on the internet, and we're glad that each one of you can be here. Uh, this is the East Main Church of Christ in Barnesville, Ohio. And uh, hopefully, again, we've come together that we might worship our God and our Father. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, it is such a glorious day, and Father, we're so very thankful that uh, you have given us instructions on this day, the Lord's day, that we are to come together to worship you, to honor you, and Father, we want to express our love to you for the great God that you are, and Father, for the guidance that we receive each day from your word. Bless this service, and we're praying, Father, that all things may go down to your name's honor and glory. Thank you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We have one song that stands for prayer, number 226, 226. of this world around about us, Father. Realizing that your creation is a great work. Father, we thank you for not only allowing us to live here in this earth, Father, but allowing us to be able to live in this great country that we live in. Allowing us, Father, the freedoms that we have. 
Father, help us to use those freedoms, Father, that we have to spread your word and to honor and glory your name. Father, we ask that you be with the leader of this country, Father, as he guides the ship. And we ask, Father, that you be with those that are representing each and every one of us, Father. That they not enact laws that are in contrary to your will, but look to you for guidance, Father. We ask a special blessing upon those men and women who are serving this country to protect those freedoms. Father, we ask that you keep them out of harm's way, but be your will, and allow them to return home safely to their family and friends. Father, we thank you for this congregation here at East Maine. We ask that you be with the elders and deacons, Father, as they labor here. Give them the knowledge and wisdom to do what is right in your sight searching your scriptures. Father, help us as individual members, Father. Encourage them, Father. Father, we ask that you be with Brother Val as he breaks unto us the bread of life. Give him a ready recollection of things that he studied and help us to apply those truths to our daily walks of life. Father, we come to you asking that you be with those that are sick. Father, we ask that you lay your healing hand upon them as only you can and return them back to a reasonable portion of health. Father, we know that temptation is always lying at our doorstep. Father, we ask that we flee that temptation and draw near to you. But we know, Father, oftentimes we give in to temptation and we sin. We ask, Father, that we that you forgive us of all of our many sins and shortcomings. And Father, may we hear those words, well done, good and faithful. This we humbly ask and pray in your Son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. About the pair of minds of the Lord's Supper, 321. 321. Jesus the Lord laid his glory aside, sin to save and make whole. Freely died our transgressions to hide. Oh. 
in Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 14 through 16. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him, and said, You have no idea how much I look forward to eating this Passover with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until I'll eat it together in the kingdom of God. And we know that Jesus had celebrated the Passover before. And you know, the discussion among the apostles and him at that time, and those other Passovers, would have been about the Exodus, and about the seven plagues, and about crossing you know, the sea. And all that discussion would have been about how great God was with them at that time, with, his, with their great-grandparents, or their forefathers had escaped the slavery of Egyptians. But this Passover was different. And Jesus was preparing for that. He says he longed. He couldn't wait to celebrate this Passover with them. And I often wonder what was going through his mind. Because he knew what he was going to go through those next few hours. But they didn't know that. And I think he must have thought, how am I going to convince these guys of all the things that they've seen me do? And they're going to watch me. They're going to watch me go through a mock trial and they're going to watch them convict me. And they're going to watch Pontius Pilate say, take him. He's yours to crucify. I've washed my hands of that. He's going to watch his disciples stand back and wonder, how could this be? Our great leader, we watched him perform miracles, raise the dead, heal the sick, and now he's going to go to a cross? How is he going to convince them that it's through that cross, through his death, through that several, that those beatings and through the nails driven through his hands and that horrible death that he was God's son? How is he going to comfort them in those dark moments? Well, we know that he did. But it wasn't during that time. It was afterwards. You see, Jesus had a lot on his plate that night when he celebrated that Passover with his disciples. And he prayed that, that they would understand, and they prayed that we would understand, that it took his suffering, and it took his death on the cross that would save us, and would get us out of the grips of Satan, and give us the opportunity to come back to him in heaven someday. So this morning as we gather around this table, and we take this bread, this bread represents Christ's body. This bread is what Jesus told his disciples to remember me at that last supper, at that last time with them, that he would celebrate the Passover. He said, take this bread and remember me. Let's pray. Father God, we, we're so grateful of your compassion. We're so grateful that you would rescue us from the grips of Satan, that through your son's body, severely beaten, hung on a cross, and died there for us. It's hard for us to understand, but on this side of the cross, we do. We understand that it took your son's death to rescue us from the grips of Satan. Father, as we take this bread, bless each one of us, and help us to take the time to remember that your son gave up his earthly body for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This blood represents Christ's body. It represents his blood. This blood sacrifice for us gives us eternal life with him. The loss of his blood gives us the hope of having everlasting life. Let's pray. Again, Father, we bow before you as your children. We thank you so much for your love and compassion that you would sacrifice your son, that he would die on that cross for each one of us, that would give us the hope of everlasting life with you. Father, bless each one of us as we take this cup that we Take a moment to reflect on this cup that it represents your son's blood. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, the early church, as they gathered together, they, they brought all their possessions. They offered up their worldly possessions so that what they knew and what they were promised, what they knew was true, is that, that following Christ would give them eternal life. We as a congregation gather up a collection each Sunday so that there's people in the world that don't have Bibles, and we can't understand that because we, we take for granted the things that we have here. But we take up a collection so that in this community, in this country, and in this world, this collection will go out and maybe give a Bible to someone or maybe, maybe help the needy or, or help an orphan or, or whatever, whatever is good in this world that we can give back to. Let's give thanks. Father, we're a blessed nation. We're a blessed people. And we sometimes take that for granted. We ask you, Father, this morning as we take out this collection that this offering comes from our hearts, that each one of us, as we give, we give with a cheerful heart, a heart hoping that this money and this, this it will go to places in the world that maybe have never heard of your son, that maybe need to hear about him. We ask you, Father, to bless us and bless each one of us as we give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Please open your Bibles to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. Our reading is initially from verses 7 through 12. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Saying to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. When they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. There have been times in the history of man in which there were very <coughs> few who served the Lord and served His purposes. You go back 4,000 years in round numbers to the time of Noah. I don't know the actual population. There are estimates as to how many lived at that time. But he only saves eight souls who remain to do his work. You go back about 2,500 years to the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. They will rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and they will do so with great opposition. You go back to the time when Christ died, maybe that same year, maybe in the spring of the following year, Luke records to Theophilus that the church was 120 in Acts 115. Compared to the population of the world at that time, that was very few. Do we get disheartened or discouraged when we see a few doing the work of the church? When perhaps we wonder how many of us are disciples? 
in a world that measures in the billions? I want you to remember that quality, not quantity, is the key word with regard to God and His work. Consider, if you will, 2 Chronicles, the 14th chapter. Let me set the scene. King Asa is ruling over Israel. The time is about 900 B.C. He does the work of the Lord. He removes all the high places and all the pillars and the altars to unknown gods. But then he faces a very severe test. The writer of Chronicles says that a million Ethiopians with 300 chariots confront Asa and a much smaller number of those who are the Lord's people. And I pick up with that in 2 Chronicles 14. And I want to read verses 9 through 13. Then Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots, and he came to Maresha. So Asa went out against him. They set the troops in battle array in the valley Sephatha at Maresha. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you. And in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown. And they could not recover. For they were broken before the Lord and his army. <coughs> And they carried away very much spoil. There's nothing in the narrative to indicate that Asa took an accounting of weapons or what their superiority was. What is accounted for is that Asa knew that with the Lord on his side, it didn't matter whether he had one or twenty or thirty or three hundred. God is able to work with the few to accomplish great things. In Acts the 17th chapter, as Paul and Silas are at Thessalonica, this is about 54 AD, their preaching causes those who are rulers in Thessalonica to say, they're turning the world upside down. And this is only two men. But I believe indeed they were turning the world upside down. I believe that whenever God's people are true to his word and they realize that God is with them, that the world can indeed be turned upside down when we walk by faith and not by sight. What has God chosen? Well, Paul writes to Corinth in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 27 and 28, and it's interesting the list that he uses to describe what God is working with. The foolish, the weak, the base, the things which are despised, the things which are not. To accomplish the spread of his word. To accomplish salvation. Our weakness is sometimes what God needs to work with so that we don't become overly exuberant and proud of our accomplishments. God may do great things through those who appear to the world to be insignificant, who the world marginalizes, you know, pushes them out to the margins, they're not seen as the key group. They're not seen as the elite. This is who God chooses to do His work. 
In 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, you have the wonderful story of Elisha the prophet. You remember the scene, he's at Dothan. The Assyrian king has asked that he be identified because Elisha is always warning Israel when the Assyrian king is taking military action. And so the Assyrian king sends a great army to Dothan to capture Elisha. And his manservant is kind of wringing his hands and saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha says to the Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes are open, he sees something he could not see a moment before, and that is the host of heaven. And the Assyrian army is struck blind, and Elisha and his manservant lead them to Samaria. And then their eyes are opened. And Elisha makes a plea that none of them are harmed, and they're not. Two men and God overcome the military might of the Assyrians and lead them around like sheep. Because Elijah, Elijah is faithful and God works with few. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 20, there is an encouragement given to all of us. Jesus says, wherever two or three, two or three, are gathered together in his name, he will be there. I believe that. I've always believed that ever since I was baptized. I have preached to 800 to 1,000 people and I've preached to two people. I'm on a ridge down here in Noble County. Two women were all that were left in that congregation. There's more there now. But I believe whether it's 2,000 or it's two, God is there in presence with his people. That is his promise. No matter what is going on, no matter what the numbers are on the face of the earth, God remembers to a thousand generations. And he is sure to gather together with his people when they come together to worship him. Go back to Psalm 105 with me a moment. Psalm 105 because I didn't finish. So we left off with verse 12 where it says, when they, when they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. Now let's continue. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. I believe that when you are in the timeline, whether it's 4000 BC or it's 2020, no matter where you are on the face of the earth, whether it's in the Middle East or it's on the North American continent, or it's in Russia, or it's in Asia. God is with you. And no matter what is happening, whether it's strife or it's famine or it's pestilence or it's extremes of nature, God is with you. God will always be with you when you are faithful to Him. And He will lead you. And He will deliver you. In Judges, the seventh chapter, you have another example of the few. You know the story, and it's the story of Gideon. I've told that story many times. I've used it in several sermons. He starts out with thousands, and by a process of elimination, he comes down to 300. 300. And he overcomes thousands. 
Why does God do this over and over and over again? It is to illustrate and to make you aware that it's not your cleverness, it's not your strength, it's not your intelligence, it's not your money. It is God working through you to accomplish His will. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to His purpose. All things. All. In all places at all times. God is good. The word salvation in the New Testament is the word in Greek, soterion. It means deliverance. To deliver. God will deliver you at all times, in all places, through all things. Would you go to God with me in prayer? Father, we are so very, very thankful that you have given us your promises and your word down through the ages, over thousands of years. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the many numerous examples you have given us of your love and your compassion, your grace, and your ability to see us through. Thank you. We pray, Father, for every soul that's in this room right now, that you would comfort and strengthen them and bless their homes and hedge them about. We pray, Father, for the wisdom which James has told us to ask for, to understand the times in which we live and to respond accordingly as your people. Give us that insight, Father, and that courage and that strength. We ask, Father, for the forgiveness of sins, even if we're willing to forgive the sins others com commit against us. Grant us, Father, insight and strength and greater faith. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to go back to Psalm 105 if you're still there. Psalm 105. Go to verse 43. Verse 43. He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise the Lord. Our purpose in this time and this place is to keep God's laws and statutes to exemplify them, to share them with others, to teach them. If you are here this morning and you wish to become a child of God, here is his command. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the word of God. That is what you are to observe and to obey. Those of you who are disciples. Though you may be few, don't make it fewer by letting sin into your life. When you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you can do that between you and the Lord, I urge you to do it. If you need to come forward and confess and make ask for the prayers of the saints we will find joy in doing that for you and with you we're going to stand and sing if you need to come come now Terry. there's a fountain free for you and me let us taste the Will you come to this place?
Father, we do thank you for every time that we open your word, that we are encouraged, that we are edified, we are admonished, and Father, we're given hope and confidence in you and in your ability to guide us, to keep us safe, and to help us make those right decisions. And Father, that we might be a blessing to others as we live our lives each and every day. Thank you for the love of Jesus, for his sacrifice, for your love, and continue to bless us, we pray in his name. Amen. 